Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Talking History Online with the History Trust of South Australia. My name is Dr. Christy Kokigi. I'm the Director of Public Engagement at the History Trust of South Australia, for those of you who don't know me. Listen, tonight I'd like to start, as always, by acknowledging that the land we're broadcasting to you from tonight and the land that I'm coming to you from tonight is the land of the Ghana people. Um, and that the History Trust respects the primary place of Aboriginal people in the history of this place. Uh, we also acknowledge that our story, our shared story, South Australia stories, commenced long before Governor Hindmarsh proclaimed the new province of South Australia and established co a colonial government in 1836, and that Aboriginal people have a long history that extends millennia into the past. Um, but tonight we have a different kind of storytelling um, and we'll get to that in a moment, just some formalities while we're waiting for people to join us. We've got a number of you in Zoom now um, and for those that have joined us before, you know the drill. So if you've heard my spiel, um, quickly nip off and, and get yourself some refreshments. But for those who haven't, um, this is an online Zoom webinar. Um, we will have uh, two panellists tonight, two guest speakers, Dr Norris Yanu and Sarah Waters, who will, will speak for about 45 minutes in total between them, and we'll leave question and answers till the end of the session. So as always, jump on the chat, tell us where you're from. It's really great for us to export that chat at the end of the session and give it to our speakers. Um, all the, the lovely comments and words of encouragement and just a sense of where you're all from are really, really valuable in this online um, format. But if you have a question to ask of our speakers, please use the Q&A function down the bottom of your screen. If you put it in the comments, it will get lost. I promise you by the end of the 45 minutes, we won't be able to find your, your questions. So please put it in the Q&A if you have a question for our speakers. Um, and similarly, if you find a question in there that you would like answered, give it a thumbs up, bump it up the list, tell us which ones you want answered first, because we often don't get through all of our questions. Um, so we want to know from you what you'd like answered first. Um, as I said, this is a webinar. So that means all attendees, other than us, that you can, uh, uh, the panellists, all attendees are muted with no video. We, we, we frequently get a uh, hundred plus on these Zoom webinars, uh, and it would be completely unmanageable if we had to to manage everyone's sound and, and video. Um, so that's another really important reason to use the chat. It's a really nice to get a sense of who else is in the room with us. Uh, yeah, tell us where you're from. We're, again, it's really it's always really, really lovely for us to hear that we're reaching well beyond Adelaide with these webinars. We've had people interstate from regional South Australia uh, and, and overseas uh, quite regularly. So it's really lovely to, to hear where you're all from. We've still got a few people coming in. Oh, thank you. There's already some people jumping into the chat. Um, as I said, we'll do question and answers at the end. Um, and we are recording the session. Again, as always, we're recording the session. It'll be available within a couple of weeks on our SoundCloud and YouTube channels. So if you don't already follow us on, the, on History Trust socials or haven't signed up to our mailing list, please do. You'll get advance notice of, of those recordings going up and any advance notice of uh, new events that we're putting up online. Um, the last thing I guess I want to do before I introduce our speakers is, as again, as always, give a, a shout out to our fabulous History Trust support team behind the scenes. They're the ones that uh, battle on and work through all the technical difficulties that we, we may encounter. Uh, tonight we have Catherine and Jade. And I also just want to give a little shout out to Britt Burton, who until very recently has been instrumental in ensuring these talking histories uh, a huge success when they were mostly physical pre-COVID in our drill hall, right through to, to sort of pivoting, I suppose, if you will, and taking them online. Um, Britt unfortunately left the History Trust a few weeks ago. She's moved on to bigger and better things. Um, and we miss her dearly and it wouldn't be right to, to continue talking history without a little shout out to her. So thank you, Britt, but also thank you to Catherine and Jade. So if you have any trouble tonight, if you drop out, Catherine and Jade are the ones behind the scenes. If you email them, contact them, they will let, get 
help you get back in. But if you can't get back in for whatever reason, please know this is being recorded and you won't miss out. Okay, so we, we might just now get started. Um, so I'll just introduce the topic in our speakers and then we'll, we'll get going. Um, um, so uh, August in South Australia means two things, um, or two big events in, in the calendar for us. One is SALA, which is the South Australian Living Artists Festival uh, and Family History Month. Um, so tonight we're attempting to combine these two, uh, loves of ours and, and obviously loves of, of, of most of you in the audience, um, to explore the relationship between folk culture, family influences and history on art in South Australia and, and to explore that wider social and cultural context. And to help us do that tonight, we have two speakers, Dr Norris Yanu, uh, who's an Adelaide-based independent cultural historian whose writing is focused on material, folk culture and the decorative arts and crafts, uh, and particularly the way migration traditions, place and innovation have shaped our identity and our heritage. And that's where I first came to, to, to know Norris's work. I'm sure many of you have come across his proliferation of books and, and his work, and um, that's, that's, that's certainly in that migrant space is, is where I came, came to know Norris and, and really respect his voice. Uh, and our other speaker tonight is Sarah Waters, who's a South Australian based artist and writer, and her research uh, embroideries and handcrafted sculptures dwell within the gaps of history to examine Australian settler colonial homemaking patterns, um, and especially geneal genealogical ghostscapes. And so I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, so, but without further ado, I've, um, I've rattled on for long enough. Hopefully you've all you all noted your, your emergency exits, you've turned your mobile phones on to silent and you've got your refreshments and you're settled in for a, for a fascinating evening. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Norris. So Norris, we might just have to get you to unmute, sorry. Thank you very much, Kirsty, for that uh, introduction. Um, so I better jump into it. I've got my uh, phone here to time myself or maybe, yeah, start. Oh, that's not going to help. Um, well, how did I get into the area of material folk culture? Um, it began in 1982 when I um, started uh, researching uh, and writing my first book. Um, I was interested in traditions and, and like I think most writers and um, people, you know, one's mother influences you particularly. And my mother, uh, I was from Cyprus, I was three when we came over and um, she, she was very traditional in terms of food and, 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 and other customs. So there was something in me about traditions. When I started researching uh, the idea of a history of, uh, a cultural history of fired clay in South Australia to be published for the sesquicentenary in 1986. I started the research in 1982 and started looking at, well, when did the first firings happen? When did they first make bricks? Uh, what were the first pots made or sewer pipes or China painting, whatever. And I discovered one single um, entry in a directory uh, of, 1882 of a Samuel Hoffman in the Barossa Valley um, who was a potter and of course I started researching this and um, discovered uh, an amazing person an amazing um, history uh, the first image we'll go back to the first image if, if that's okay um, you'll see a family portrait photographed um, now, this was taken uh, in um, 1894, and if you have a look, uh, can I show with my, does my um, pointer show on your screens? No? My pointer doesn't show. Okay. So, what I want you to do is um, have a look at the second row, and there's a gentleman with a bowler hat sitting in front of what is a bride. So the bride's in the center of the picture, 
that's her, that's the gentleman. And that's the Potter Hoffman, Samuel Hoffman. And this is the occasion of the wedding um, celebration, following celebration of the wedding of his granddaughter in 1890, um, I said 1892, I think, didn't I? And the interesting thing about all this is that if you then look just below, you'll see some seated children and have a look at the seated boy in the middle. You've got three boys on the left. Then you've got the first, the fourth boy. That's him. Yes. That was George Hazy. He was a child who grew up on the neighboring farm of the Potter Hoffman's farm. Uh, you've got some buildings there. They're the cottages. It was a um, he, a number of uh, families that settled together there, uh, and Potter Hoffman was a farmer. Potter, he'd established a kiln, not pictured, but behind there, um, and he made his traditional wares. That person that's um, kneeling there, George Hazy, I met when he was um, fairly old. He was 90, uh, where, where's my... Yes, he was um, six years old in that picture, but I interviewed him when he was 95 uh, years old um, in 1983, I think that was. Uh, the potter, by the way, died in 1900, and this is so six years later after this photograph was taken. So I had met and talked to that person who's in the photograph, so only one degree of separation. But the interesting thing is that Potter Hoffman uh, br brings together um, a, a great story of the pre-industrial cultural traditions that were brought over by um, the um, uh, migrations, the early migrations, and particularly in the, in the 19th century in the Barossa, even though I documented other potters around Australia and in Adelaide, he was the only one who worked for at least something like 30 years uh, so that he maintained his traditions for the longest time of any potter, folk potter in Australia. Um, and in the next picture, we can see something of, that's number two. Catherine, are we here? Are you with me? Can you hear me? Second picture, thank you. Okay, and there's an example of his work. It was pretty amazing when I um, uh, met some um, descendants of uh, the Potter Hoffman, and they were amazing when I, I, I said, oh, I'd be lovely to see one of his pots. And uh, they said, oh, yes, we've got one down in the cellar. It, um, and they brought it up. It was still being used 100 years later for pickling dual gherkins. Um, he, he, there was an oral tradition that the family had, that George Hazy and other elderly members of the, uh, the Barossa community um, could recount of the oral law of the potter searching the, um, the hills, the, the Kaiser stool, and looking for places where he could get special clay for his special pots. So there was an oral tradition as well as the material remains of his work and of course, generational survivors. Um, if we go to the next picture, um, the Barossa region um, had many other material traditions, only one potter, but at least something like 120 cabinet makers had settled there and they brought their traditions of cabinet making and they were vernacular traditions and by vernacular, and I'll be talking about the word vernacular a lot, because it is about what a person who is not an elite artist as, as such, is a craftsman perhaps, has skills that are handed on orally, and who makes something which um, is not in any way pretentious, but follows a particular tradition. And folk art can, in itself, uh, be very conservative. The tradition, uh, the community doesn't allow much leeway in traditions in terms of um, innovation. They tend to stick to it. But with these potters here, uh, uh, Carl Lana, the cabinet maker, 
they did make modifications to their work which were specifically influenced by the local environment. And in this case, um, he came up with putting the tulip at, on the crest of the wardrobe, which is a Biedermeier design, a vernacular Biedermeier design, uh, and which I termed a Barossa Biedermeier. Um, I ended up going to, uh, you know, finding that I was working in folk traditions and ended up getting a, um, uh, a scholarship to go to, um, a Churchill Fellowship to go to America to study the folk um, uh, scholarship there. And um, they have a very uh, elaborate academic and other institutional and human highways and byways of folk art there. Um, it's, it's very deeply held and very respectful uh, area. It tends to be trivialized in Australia, the idea of folk art, because people tend to think of Australiana, you know, sort of the industrial uh, um, kind of productions, which have very little creativity. Can we see the next slide, please? Um, in any case, I came back and uh, researched for quite a number of years to eventually come up with this book, which was released earlier this year. Um, uh, which is the folk life history of Australia, looking, if you like, it's a history of folk art in Australia. I didn't use folk art on the, on the front page, or the front cover, because I didn't think people would um, click to it as much as just saying it was a folk life history with art, diversity and storytelling. And it includes the indigenous um, uh, context of what we mean by folk art as well. Um, and, and that is elaborated in, in, in the a second chapter. The first chapter looks at, well, what exactly um, uh, do we mean by, I called it the meaning of folk art past and present, and I looked at the latest international scholarship, um, ideas of what constitutes folk art, uh, highlighting its, its defining traits as well as its shifting boundaries, uh, and the different inter interdisciplinary models that are, are used to explain, if you like, or to categorize folk art, folklore, cultural theory, ethnography, anthropology, if you like, and the way different groups see folk art, the creators themselves, the academics, the museum curators, and the community, how do they see and define folk art? What do we mean by outsider art, primitive, naive, popular art? How do, are they related to uh, folk art? And if you like, some quick word grabs about folk art. It's an outcome of a creative process whereby a mix of personal and collective narrative is given material form. It's the outcome of an individual's creative response to communal or shared experience. It's a creative product that flows out of the experiences of everyday life. And folk art can act as social documents of Australia's experience depicting past and present ways of thinking, living and doing things. It's a celebration of the past and the telling of personal, family, community, and national stories. Um, it, it divulges lifestyle, proclaims beliefs and values, acclaims our religion, uh, spirituality, and comments on social injustice. It lapoons political individuals and commemorates special occasions. The art of the peoples portrays the way we see ourselves collectively as a nation. Uh, in particular, I emphasize the uh, concept of the, the vernacular uh, the creation of local forms through an informal process of selection and fusion, you know, of past uh, creative expressions under the influence of the new environment and with the other cultural groups. And in the end, I, I've decided that folk creativity it was the creativity that I was interested in. How did these people come out with these amazing objects which told something very deep? and instinctive about themselves and their communities and how they engage with them. So um, moving on, how am I going with time? Chapter four, um, I looked at the belief system, the, uh, the religious belief system that under, underpins folk art. And I actually did a comparison of the belief system of the Barossa Lutherans. So we can go to the next image. Um, which I compared in a way to the spiritual belief system that determines indigenous art. Um, I can't go into this, I haven't got the time here, but I, I drew some parallels and it, it's that deep instinctual um, feeling and uh, 
communication with one's own religious feelings and the community that is expressed. And in this instance, this um, particular object is an example, if you like. Uh, there are other many examples in my book, but this is particularly one. Um, it, it brings together a lot of European folk motives. Uh, it's um, a crown of thorns style of frame, which represents the crown of thorns of, on, on, on um, Jesus Christ on his head. It's a stylized version. Uh, the images in the middle show um, the, the, the distance between two people who are their hands are um, uh, handshaking. It's a spiritual connection in terms of a symbol. The anchor is a very ancient symbol uh, of uh, hope and um, uh, resurrection. And the uh, very tiny symbol on the bottom right-hand side of the sun is representative of Christ. So there's a number of religious um, images here that drove this particular person to create that particular object, which tells quite a lot about that community and people. Now, another um, form of folk art uh, in the next image is uh, actually gender based can um, uh, uh, what is the role if any uh, um, of gender in folk creativity uh, and in this chapter um, chapter five I look at masculine expression working men's traditions this is a, a, a very typical picture it happens to be one in Adelaide of the Holford pottery um, uh, the pottery was established in the 1870s it's a semi-industrial pottery. There were many around the country. Uh, they employed uh, groups of men, depending on their size, to make semi-industrial wares. So the forms of pottery they were making, you wouldn't say are folk pottery, but during the, this activity, the working men often made pieces of their own art that they called Foreignly, they were often called working men's pieces, which is a derogatory term, but some of them called them foreigners because they were something foreign to the usual output of the pottery. And they were handmade and they um, could be doorstops or mantelpieces. And in the next picture, there's one example of um, one made by um, Purse Wood um, in the Brompton Bowdoin area in Adelaide on the Western Plains below the affluent. Um, uh, North Adelaide uh, mansions down below in Highmarsh, uh, Bowdoin, Brompton were these tiny little cottages. There were lots of pug holes where clay had been dug out since 1836, the year of settlement, for making um, bricks and sewer pipes. And, and these men were working in awful conditions, but there was a community, the streets were, were just streets of mud. Um, interspersed with the smoking stacks of uh, kilns, um, pug holes that clay was dug out of, uh, fairly awful conditions of work, um, but a very tight-knit community um, of a lot of them come, having coming out from the potteries and brickmakers from England and their generation. Uh, but they, these, these works, often they were handmade and the, this frog and uh, lizard figure group um, is representative of what Purse Wood would do. He would, after working at, at the pottery, he would go down into the pug holes where there were pools of water and there were frogs and lizards had formed a little ecosystem and, and he would model these. It's quite an interesting story, um, but it tells, tells us something about the harsh environment, the rural cottages, the mud streets, but the folk values, the strong familial and social ties, you know, these pieces will be handed as, as tokens, you know, to, to, you know, by a father to, to his wife or a lover to his uh, uh, sweetheart. Um, and the working men were a very tight knit group of, um, you know, there was a camaraderie amongst them and um, it, it was a very much a masculine job. So moving on to the feminine realm, as I called it in chapter six, the textile arts, as the next image shows, we have a counterpoise for the um, masculinity. So can we see the next image? Not working? 
so we're sustaining the gender theme here. And in this uh, uh, chapter, I examine the feminine realm and its domestic setting. Um, and although the, the uh, textile arts are, are not exclusively gender based, we can say that the lasting dominance by women is fairly undeniable. Um, and they bring together a number of very interesting things, so middle class family values, uh, community continuity, the making do tradition. There were woggers or bush rugs that emerged as a vernacular Australian folk quilt. Um, of course, the 1850s saw the creation of the Eureka flag by a group of women uh, and, and so on. Um, so today, and I'm sure Sarah Waters will be able to fill us in a lot on this from her own experience and practice, uh, but the textile arts continue to be a widespread uh, folk practice for women who wish to use it, not just in the home, but as symbolic um, and historic associations to circumscribe per personal identity and social values and political beliefs. So there's a very intimate link between the textile arts and feminine creativity and storytelling, which, which I investigate. Um, and this is the time quilt by Mary Jane Hannaford, 1840 to 1930. She made it in um, 1924 uh, when she was uh, getting quite elderly. And it, it's an, it, there's, a, there's an image of it somewhere there. She's, she's got a walking stick and it's about time passing on. And it, it's a wonderful storytelling quilt um, in, in, now in the National Gallery. The next image um, shows us another example, the Barbara Hanrahan um, uh, community tapestry. So th this is a very interesting uh, um, uh, process where it's not an individual making the artwork. Uh, it's, it's a circle again uh, of women. And in this case, volunteers, up to 40 volunteers, uh, coordinated by Kay Lawrence and other professionals, in this case, they're um, making a tapestry of um, uh, one of Barbara Hanrahan's um, uh, memorizing one of her um, uh, images, her uh, visual art images. It's now in the Hawke Center. So we're moving on, a completely different category is that of what I call cultural memory and the folk art landscape. And um, here uh, we see um, uh, the whole environment of a front garden or back garden becoming an artwork. Um, it's, it, it's often very eccentric um, and uh, it, it, it's, it's plants bringing sculpture and architecture, mosaics, cacti, junk recycling and other transformation uh, you know, reaffirming identity and uh, it's, it's an imagining reordering and, me and making meaning in one's life. This particular uh, image shows Iris Howe's um, mosaic garden in Millicent, um, which she started in 1900 and uh, no, not in 1905, she was born in 1905, the garden started in 1951. And she brought in the uh, neighbors and um, the community of uh, Middleton, um, they all contributed um, their broken teapots and teacups and whatever to help uh, bring for her to have the raw materials for assembling this um, uh, garden. And of course, it, it brings together um, the uh, French uh, reconstructionist Claude Levi Strauss model of the bricoleur, the junk collector, who transforms. Um, jettison cast offs, industrial, pre industrial, uh, into new models of cultural images to make new representations. The next image um, shows a garden gnome, a um, ceramic garden gnome by um, Thomas Bosley, who was a brickmaker who was out of work in the 1930s with the Depression. Uh, and decided to set up a pottery and started making these garden gnomes. Um, uh, he's, um, he and his son, uh, who was born in Australia, but he was born in England. Um, and uh, from the Staffordshire area. Um, and so he was influenced by that tradition there. And these garden gnomes, frogs and other um, very now very collectible objects um, would, used to grace the um, uh, the, the homes of um, Adelaide gentry and 
and working class. And we move on to the portraits of Australia. Um, the next image. Now I go through a whole series of naive and um, other kinds of folk painters um, who are, if you like, unofficial documentaries of, of uh, local histories. Um, they um, have a naive, um, uh, you know, they're not trained, they don't have um, the academic background, but they want to say something about themselves and the communities that they're involved in. And naive paintings often have a, a life that you, you don't see in a, a academic work. This painting um, chapter also includes indigenous artists who have combined their traditional dream time um, uh, patterning and the uh, images that they are, if you like, um, uh, can claim to use in their particular region, in this case, the background dot, dot painting, um, with more westernized um, symbolism, uh, those figures um, beautifully distributed over the canvas, very lively and um, uh, wonderful by Panjili Mary McLean. Uh, and there are a number of those kinds of images. Um, and the next uh, image on here shows um, Iris Frame, who was brought up in the Murray land near the river. And in her uh, later years, when she'd moved to uh, Panola, she started painting on bits of wood and corrugated iron. And she came up with the whole um, uh, mythology, uh, her own mythology, but she was influenced apparently by um, ancient dream time um, uh, mythology as well, which she incorporated in her uh, naive painting. Um, uh, she believed that she was going to be bigger than um, Elvis Presley, uh, as she once said. Um, and her works uh, are very joyful uh, and incorporate memory and um, the communities that she was involved in. Uh, they're, they're wonderful uh, compositions. Um, and in a later chapter, I do have a chapter on um, From the Bush, the making do tradition, but I don't have an image there, so we'll leave that. But the romantic rebels, outsider and insider images, so that's the next image, um, has a range of mostly from more recent migrants of the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, or, or some earlier, um, who had their experience of migration um, that in some cases was fairly traumatic. Um, but in this instance, it's more the influences of the family. And um, uh, Arminio Ali, um, this plaque, if you like, for me is a very much almost like a Byzantine or, or Roman carved uh, naive, but, but it reminds me of the um, uh, kinds of images I saw in, 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 in marble sculptures in Rome, ancient Rome. And um, again, you've got the naive proportions, you know, he wasn't trained in anything, but there's a joy there, this uh, representation of the family wedding. Um, and uh, he, he did many kinds of sculptures, which also had a look at uh, sport and um, uh, other Australian um, vernaculars. Um, the next image, uh, again, an Indigenous um, work here, Marie Evelyn uh, Portjimi. Um, and this is a continuation of uh, traditional um, indigenous weaving practice and patterns. Um, Tiwi designs also uh, branched into from carvings into ceramic objects um, so that we had a Western, you have a Western influence, but the continuity of the indigenous dreamtime uh, patterns uh, and um, 
mythology uh, are still there. Um, the next image shows um, a Peter Hart who works in the uh, under the mid north and. Again, this is the uh, Claude Levy Strauss where he gets um, uh, salvages, recycles, um, cast off industrial objects like the Meta's um, stove, the Kookaburra stove that some people might be familiar with. And it, this is a meat safe, very typical of what the Barossa Lutherans used to make, but it's his own version, it's painting on it. Um, and it's linked to the uh, make do bush tradition. Um, and the next image, again, um, a folk imbued um, visual statements, in this case by Pierre Cavallan, who just goes to secondhand stores and um, garage sales and picks up these old um, uh, medals or bits of jewelry. And um, uh, in that um, bricola, um, type of model of understanding of jettison materials reconfigured so that their original cultural meaning is uh, rejigged and um, so institutional badges, tourist insignia, RSL badges if you like, um, are, are put together into new combinations um, bringing together, if you like, folk memories or community identities. Uh, uh, so that kind of influence coming from the past community that perhaps doesn't exist anymore. Um, and also, I even looked at um, things like tattoos and even big things like the next image. And um, in this instance, um, this big thing, um, I don't think it's um, kitschy, it's beautifully made. And in fact, why would I consider it a folk object? It's quite industrial, really, in the sense of how it was made. But it's the big lobster, and um, it's in Kingston. And what's Kingston known for? Well, in the nearby shores, they harvest lobsters. And that's a source of pride for the uh, locals. And it's this giant image is an attraction. It's um, uh, a local response, it's a vernacular response to the collective cultural and regional identity. It's a kind of a folk art pointer. Uh, and you can say that for some of the other big things like uh, the big Ned Kelly, not in South Australia, or the big, perhaps not so much the big rocking horse, but there's Map the Miner in Kapunda. And imagine if Map the Miner was where the lobster is and the lobster is in Kapunda, and they're not in the local place. Their vernacular uh, power is totally gone. So it is a matter of where they are and that connection to the cultural place, cultural sign places. Um, look, it, it, it's a, a very exciting area because I think folk art in Australia, um, if you go around to the museums around Australia where I source much of this material, uh, and our own uh, Art Gallery of South Australia and the um, uh, South Australian Museum, they have collections of these things. We don't always see them, but they are important because they do bring together so much of our history of South Australia, so much about past communities and so much about how people have expressed themselves and in how they engage with others and what mattered in their lives. So I'll finish there. I hope I haven't spoken too long. Uh, no, thank you, Norris. That was uh, very, very fascinating and illuminating. Thank you. Um, right on time. Um, yeah, just that's really good. Just that that idea that yeah, that connection to place is so important. Uh, I think on the big lobster myself. I mean, you're right. It, it, it's a it's an amazing piece and. Um, but if it wasn't where it is, it just it loses all its power. And I just I, I took my kids there recently and and they absolutely love it. It's all they talk about in that entire holiday where we spent all this money and it's the big lobster, the one photo in front of the big lobster. And so it sparked an interest and, and a passion for the local area. And, and yeah, just these things are really, really interesting. Now I will.
just invite people to start putting questions in the Q and A again after we hear from Sarah. We will um, we will address some questions. I've got a few questions I'm going to put in myself. I will also just remind people in the chat, just make sure you're chatting with everyone and not just the hosts and panellists. It's lovely for us to hear from you, but also others may, may want to hear from you and know where you're from as well. Um, so thank you again, Norris. Now it's my pleasure to, to introduce Sarah Waters, as I said, a South Australian based artist. And, and actually at the moment, so you've got a project at the moment in the Art Gallery or with um, a Guildhouse Fellowship, haven't you? Sp and sponsored by the Art Gallery or with the Art Gallery of South Australia, supported by the James and Diana Ramsey Foundation. So one of those institutions Norris was just referring to where a lot of these amazing pieces can be found. So Sarah, um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Yes, I do. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm just going to share my screen. So bear with me. I hope everyone can see that clearly. Um, so I just wanted to uh, reiterate um, Christy's point about acknowledging that I'm speaking from Ghana country today. And it's always important for me to acknowledge that I grew up on Bowen Dick country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I am in deep gratitude for the wisdom, care and nurturing sustained by First Nations people for thousands of years. And this is an important part of my practice, which is why I always begin this way, because I'm grappling with coming from a line of settler colonisers that goes back to 1838 in South Australia. And I'm looking at the repercussions of their making home here. Much of my research is about my own family history and their passed along traditions and analysing how we can both honour and redirect these traditions to go forward into a future where taking responsibility and caring for country are prioritised. So I'll be talking about that through these um, focuses of family history and folk art today and how they have influenced my own practice. And so, you know, a lot of my work is challenging and it's confronting for me to look at my family history through this lens but it does remain driven by truth telling which I feel is necessary to to go forward so that doesn't want to oh here we go <laughs> hopefully I'm not going to move on many slides um so many of my artworks uh which regularly step off from domestic textile traditions begin from local and very specific family histories. And then they circle out to encompass national and even global narratives, particularly making links across other colonized uh, lands. So beginning with family histories keeps details and also regional specifics in circulation. That's, I see it as a, a way to keep these stories going and these, um, this knowledge going. This artwork that I'm showing now is a good case in point, being informed from family tales and photographs, as you can see that I've put here. Um, but also it, it comes, it's built out of knowledge from other people's diaries, um, scientific records, fashion trends in the early 1900s and so on. Um, from this family photograph album of the home down at Robe, actually, which was called The Nest, I could witness that my ancestors went on wallaby hunts. And it actually says in there, all, all these snaps taken out at a wallaby hunt. Um, and I also learned that the Tulak wallaby, um, which was in the Robe region, went extinct around the same time that my ancestors were out on these so-called wallaby hunt. So I use this information and I also used a photograph of my ancestor here, Wilhelmina. She's my great, great grandmother. Um, she actually in the photograph has a fox fur draped around her rather than a wallaby, but I've, I've um, kind of married these stories and tangles together to create new records that are much more, I guess, telling of, of the truths of what happened upon this country. So this is also stitched upon a family towel, and I use techniques that are imported to instruct to Australian shores with colonisation. So different forms of embroidery. Um, the face there of Wilhelmina is stitched uh, using. Actually, I was at the Australian Tapestry Workshop and could use their cottons and wools that are dyed on site there to, uh, like, petty point a um, this face, which is almost like a patch that's stitched on to here. <laughs> 
And I make from family histories to creatively care for what I call intergenerational knowledge, especially matriarchal knowledge. And I see this as extending the extensive family history that my mum spent 40 years of her life upon, and also as a way to give recognition to unseen or undervalued perspectives. Family histories, as opposed to some more official histories, in, often incorporate oral histories and stories, um, and often the know-how as well that's carried along by mothers and grandmothers. And family histories are ever fascinating to me, as often they're stranger than fiction. You can't make them up sometimes how, how coincidental they are. And they're specifically detailed and linked to certain individuals in certain places and certain circumstances. But beyond those specifics, they're also relatable and overlap with other families and their experiences as well. So I think of family histories carried along in many folk expressions as often they're like allegories that there's much to learn about them going forward. So my interest into uh, local and family histories began about a decade ago when I was invited to engage with a number of collections and the Migration Museum being one of them, the UniSA Architectural Museum, even the War Memorial, as well as visiting places such as Talem Town or the Loxton um, Historical Village. In this delving into archives and collections and museums, I often seek out the, the home craft crafted artifacts, say doilies or quilts or runners or embroidery. So I'm drawn to the, um, the textiles. And I think about homely spaces and their decoration and the objects they hold as witnesses or tellers of untold truths. And you can see my space behind me, I collect Semco long stitches as a 1980s kind of kit form of um, home craft. But I feel like it, it conveys a certain view of Australia that, um, was for some reason came out in strength in the 1980s. Family photographs uh, particularly are portals for me to reach back in and to try and see the past. And that's very true of um, this work here, Basking, which again looks at my great great grandmother, um, who was a very strong matriarch in her family. And I use these photographs to try to have a sense of the person that I've never I've never met you know she she passed away before I was born but to look at that knot of inherited legacies um, in this case I'm examining unjust privileges that came with the whiteness of skin during the white Australia policy in the first half of the 1900s so they're they're difficult truths but ones that can't be shied away from as well I think to to deal with the, these unjust biases that we've inherited um, the legacies from. So while my postgraduate studies, which went until the um, late 2018 around genealogical ghostscapes, so they focused upon um, that recognition of the way that spaces and places are haunted by these pasts that we may not know all the details of. More recently, I think it's become more pressing in my practice to think toward a survivable future. And currently I'm undertaking, as um, Christy said, a research project, which I'm calling Future Traditions, which is enabled by the Guildhouse Fellowship. And so I'm looking at how we survive an ever more threatened future, which I believe relies upon knowledge from our ancestors. So family photographs, domestic objects and folk art and their expressions can contain this knowledge. The past traditions of slower pre-industrial eras I believe can guide us in how to survive if we no longer had access to what we do now, which is an advanced capitalist material world. And these are the eight categories I've kind of broken down. And you can have a look at this on my website in your own time. They all lead into these explorations I've been going on to look at evidence of, for example, how to repurpose and repair traditions of comforting with soft furnishings or warm protective clothing. Also how knowledge filled stories and narratives of hope are displayed in our lived in areas and how these propel us forward. How we might use activist textiles to tell truths. How we also slow down through these methods of stitch or textile methods to fall into a rhythm that has ancient roots and you know, links back to seasons and um, can maybe help us live more mindfully or at least calmly. And I think that has come about through the pandemic as well.
we do live in very different circumstances to our ancestors and not all traditions are of benefit to reinstate. We should keep that in mind. Um, but examining domestic traditions, which have been important and they have sustained humans for thousands of years until being challenged uh, more so in the last few hundred years, that can revive critical knowledge that I think is worth preserving. So folk art, which as Norris um, discussed, and I'm sure goes into great detail in his book, goes by other names and other is a, a tangle to try to define it. But you might hear like popular art or sometimes I use home craft as a term, is a mode of making that can propel traditions along family lines and is also, as Norris said, of the people. Like family history, folk art is often about commonly shared events, so births or deaths or marriages and also homemaking as well. And so my research is centred around Australian folk expressions in particular, particularly those from settler colonists and their ensuing families, which developed their own flavour because they had their origins in a simultaneous longing for a faraway home and a continuing of those imported traditions and then also grappling with how to make home upon this unfamiliar land with different plant species and, and shells, for example, or, or um, uh, other found materials. So I just wanted to stop on this for a second to say this is a, a latch hook, which is a technique that I discovered. My great great grandmother used to make rugs from too. I'm sure hers were probably the kit version, which were very popular in the early 1900s. Um, but this rug uses all repurposed wool purchased from op shop. So it's this kind of grabbing of materials from other people's family homes or family stories and repurposing them towards a new, um, a new narrative. Um, so in his essay um, in Everyday Art, Australian Folk Art Catalogue, Jim Logan writes that, and to quote him, folk art is story, storytelling made material. It is, if you will, oral history in hard copy. And so I see folk art as a mode of translation from stories to material objects. And materials for folk art are often found, they're repurposed, they include gathered materials, and they can express particular regions, such as the shells that are here as part of this grotto. They're all shells I collected over a year long period upon um, the robe beaches, mainly Long Beach. And snap with uh, Norris, I made this grotto in response to growing up in the southeast and visiting the Shell Museum in Millicent. Uh, it was this kind of, you know, place of great imagination. Also, the Tarpina Fairy Tale Park was another one where people created their own worlds over years and years. And that that investment is something I often turn back to as an artist. That obsessive investment and dedication to these found materials. And I think this is perhaps the Southeast epitome folk of folk expression. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. Um, so one of the things that most interests me about folk art is how it regularly develops from a need or, or from a lack, um, causing makers to make do with whatever materials they can find. And this has caused me to reflect on where folk art is now and what its role might be in the future. And I'd like to offer a challenge um, to what has been described as the decline of folk art. So within folk art um, can be seen the ways in which people, particularly in times of challenges to their survival or identity, can take collective and community shared traditions and use them, adjust them, repurpose them towards their own needs and their own expressions. And I have hope for the future um, and as I said, I counter those many texts that say that folk art has ended as an expression. So artist Jeff McMillan, who's done a lot of research into folk art, um, says that from the mid 17th to the mid 20th century, or he offers the mid 20th century as an end date that reflects the period before folk art arguably became a commodity or too self-conscious is what he says. And Jim Logan who also writes a lot on um, folk art, says that in general, folk art production sh shrank from significant production with the introduction of television. People no longer choose to fashion items for the home in their leisure hours. Mass media culture and the economics of consumerism have commandeered our attention. 
And I guess we could also add to the, the ways that people maybe have stopped making so much in their home uh, that the growing post-war prosperity allowed families to buy consumer goods rather than have to make do and make them themselves. And there was an uprising of kits and that mass-produced home decor, which certainly took an emphasis away from the handcrafted. But perhaps, and this is my suggestion, that as we navigate pandemics, when we have seen the rise of handcraft again and people maybe not being able to get supplies and um, using what's around them, also um, uh, interruptions to global supply chains, an economic downturn and growing climate disasters, which are causing many to seek less impactful ways of living, perhaps this end date will see more of a pause or a temporary slowing down before being taken up again. And perhaps a folk art of now can be redirected towards analysing some misunderstandings of this country, which have been inherited from settler colonial forebears. And instead, folk art expressions of now could be used to finally see and be activists for interconnected ecologies, communities, local species, and give them the care and respect they deserve, and to lessen the spread of waste through making do and reuse. And that's the, the aim of my future traditions project. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, also very interesting and illuminating. Um, we have got a number of questions in the Q&A right now. I'm just gonna start off with one that I had just because I've got the floor. Um, but so um, you both touch on, and maybe from slightly different perspectives, but you both touch on the importance of folk art and creative traditions, um, imported or otherwise, uh, in, in terms of the way we see ourselves collectively uh, as a community or as families, as communities, as nations, um, and that those sort of those creative expressions, um, you know, they, they, they don't happen in a vacuum. They happen under the influence of new environments and cultural groups and other bits and pieces, uh, and that they really do tell us something about ourselves. Um, but that there is this uh, almost... Um, aversion to them or this this lack of recognition about their importance in that storytelling and in our idea of ourselves as a nation and of our identities. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk as for, for a museum person like me and, and and obviously as a parent too and I seek out these experiences with my kids it's like they're, they're really important and I see this stuff everywhere and, and but I'm just wondering because we do have a question in here about, because um, Norris, I think you had mentioned a little, like in your presentation, you mentioned how academically and otherwise this is taken a little bit more seriously in the US. So I'm just wondering if either of you or both of you can can comment on um, its standing, you know, in Australia versus somewhere like the US and, and why we see it as, as, you know, why we see the vernacular or these, these, these making of, um, you know, creative making of, of histories and culture and um, as why do we see it differently here or why does it not get the recognition as a as a really valid way to to examine ourselves and explain ourselves? Um, that's Sarah. <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, uh, why don't we see folk art in a um, respectful way, if you like, and um, uh, realise its potential for storytelling. And um, uh, I like what, uh, Sarah, what you said about how it could bring um, uh, uh, knowledge from the past, if you like, one way of putting it, uh, preserving memories, of course, and um, ways of thinking that perhaps when applied now um, could be survival for all the crises that we see around us. Um, it, it, it was extraordinary that in the USA that there are quite a number of institutions. Um, the um, uh, University of Pennsylvania, which has a folklore uh, department, um, uh, and Professor Henry Glassy, who um, was my PhD um, examiner, and I went over there and saw him again, and. He's written a number of books um, and it, it was almost like um, 
uh, and, and the museums of folk art that were all over the country uh, and the number of folk artists that were still practicing um, was extraordinary. Uh, so all I'm doing, what am I doing? I'm emphasizing that they still um, continue to respect folk art. Um, I do tend to see, um, I don't agree that there was a cutoff in 1950. Uh, I don't remember the author who said that 17th century up to 1950 and then folk art isn't really <laughs> exist anymore or something like that. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I started off with the pre-industrial um, village agrarian economy uh, of craft folk art at the pot of uh, Hoffman and furniture makers and so on. Um, then you've got the industrial zone and I talked about how you still have those people working in this industrial period, late 19th century, early 20th century, up to the 1950s, certainly uh, around Australia, making these uh, their own little folk objects, which were quite important to them uh, in terms of the, the way when I interviewed these people and the way they became tokens of love and whatever. Uh, and now they tell quite important stories about the conditions of those people. Um, so, it, 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 and then, then I looked at, well, what's the contemporary situation in my last chapter? Um, and, there, you know, Sarah, um, in, in a sense, you know, they're, they're, um, I, th I see you as a, a little bit of a bricoleur, if I may use that term. And you mentioned the, re the repurposing. That's, um, but, you know, the question is, you are looking at folk processes and you are um, repurposing materials and your works show elements of uh, folk techniques, if you like, um, although there are some um, uh, like the pat patterning, photographic patterning and stuff on textiles and so on, which is um, a, a more advanced technological technique. Um, but then would, you, would I say that your works are folk art? No, they're conceptualized and they're interrogating folk art and they're being stimulated by folk art. You're not a folk artist, you're an artist. Can I say that? <laughs> yes, I had to come with to the same reckoning as I was um, doing this research as well. And I thought that's that's the distinction. I'm a contemporary artist who's researching folk art for those expressions that, uh, like Christy said, I think have been undervalued in an Australian context. And I guess, um, and Norris, I also, you know, would say that I really questioned that end point of folk art because I think people are always making in some way from a domestic setting um, and the I guess these people like to put parameters around things but uh, I, I guess I use it as a counterpoint to argue back against but I guess just with my feminist hat on I look at often particularly through a textile lens of the undervaluing of those uh, folk or um, home craft expressions and think that you know we have inherited a lot of bias against uh, Victorian clutter or um, uh, particularly women haven't had as you know their their enterprises and highly skilled textiles in a lot of the cases hasn't been valued to the same as say an oil painting that's been um, in the gallery so I can't help but bring in those kind of perspectives around the undervaluing and I don't have the same um, uh, research experience to see uh, how folk art is valued differently um, across the world other than to note that there are folk museums in many countries, particularly European countries across the world that aren't so present in Australian context? Look, you know, um, I mean, people like you, artists like you are, of course, profiling folk art in the sense, uh, as well as um, the stories you're telling through it and its repurposing and so on. And that that is bringing it uh, to the notice of contemporary uh, audiences. Um, the Art Gallery of South Australia has a collection of um, Barossa folk art, which they've 
um, put up on a wall. There's no interpretations of it, just titles. Um, I suggested to them that, um, uh, and there was a bit of promotional uh, self-promotion in it. I said, oh, look, you know, um, uh, perhaps you might like to do an article in the South Australian, um, uh, the, the magazine that they produce once every two or three months. And um, uh, because it's got so many, it's got an emphasis on South Australian folk art because only in South Australia, because of the Barossa's uh, isolation, were their generational practitioners of folk um, art, uh, that is to say, uh, their furniture and the pottery, textiles and so on. It didn't occur in the other states. They, were, they quickly industrialized and those people stopped their practice. Um, unfortunately, they felt that um, the, the ma their magazine was for telling their stories. And I thought that's strange because it's really about the, <laughs> the images in the Borgar about what they are on the walls there. Um, so they haven't actually made that collection a destination yet. There is the Barossa wall. Yeah, but it's not, it's not, it's never been made a destination like the uh, Art Deco stuff or the design furniture of the 50s or the indigenous material. Um, so there is a, it's strange to see that that barrier is also there in, in those institutions. They are institutions mostly of academic material and perhaps they're still, I don't know, understanding the value of that. Um, anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd say that because I like it to be something we can discuss. Um, I, I, can I go on just very quickly about your very first image of the Tulak wallaby? Th th there's an image in my book of a skull of a thylacine that's been made into a pin cushion oh, wow. by the mother of a family whereby the men folk had been given uh, there were bounties on the Tasmanian tiger in the late 1890s in, and into the 1920s and so this particular family set up these traps and they went out hunting as well and so on and poison to get rid of them as much as possible. And one of the skulls, uh, you know, was presented to the mother and she made a pincushion out of it, which was kind of like a little bit parallel to your story. Um, and so it, it tells that story as well um, about the environment and what we have done. So it's important. Incidentally, I, I, um, uh, p political activism caused the creation of those Dublin sculptures. You know, Premier Olsen was going to allow a rubbish dump at Dublin, north of Adelaide, and um, the local community didn't want the rubbish dump there. Do you know about those sculptures? A giant cockroach, uh, Ned Kelly on a um, pile of uh, hay saying, you know, we're going to shoot you, Olsen, stuff like that. And they became a tourist attraction. Um, but that was stimulated by that political um, situation. And they're quite, there's still some there. They're quite interesting. Yes, excellent. Um, thank you both. Um, now, look, we are over time and some people will need to leave us because it's right at that dinner time point. Uh, but for those of you who can stick around, we're going to try and get through another couple of questions. Um, and again, if you need to leave us now, this will be recorded and you can tune in to, to the final bits of conversation. Just because that ties in really nicely, what you've both just been saying ties in really nicely with one of the questions. Because um, Sarah, I think you you talked about that handmade craft and and the, the decline or the you know or, or maybe not who knows uh, whether it declined or not but um but also with the the pandemic and we see those less in, less impactful ways of living and perhaps folk art is a way to to sort of address and redirect some of those misunderstandings um, about our past and our history because um, there's a question here about uh, do you, do you think that this make do aspect of folk art um, particularly lends itself to resistance messaging um, and you had shown that rebellion image and, and if you could both talk a little bit about that and because we have seen a rise in this uh, especially during the pandemic and and, and um, yeah it gives people a voice so I was wondering if you could both talk about that a little bit yeah I well 
I think, um, particularly from a textile perspective, you know, textiles are, if, well, they often say the third highest pollutant in the world, if not the first, I think. I mean, there was the shocking um, foreign correspondent and ABC's uh, report last week into Ugandan, um, ex the exportation of Australian textiles to Uganda and the, the great kind of climate cost that's happening. Um, and so I think, you know, to make do intentionally with textiles, whether that be mend clothing, make your own clothing, um, reuse textiles as our ancestors would have, you know, to rip them up and use them as rags or to turn them into a rug or to, um, you know, use them, just use them for other purposes. That's very political. It can be a very um, pertinent activist um, action because you are not putting money into that expectation of that consumer cycle with fashion you know that is fast fashion so just from that perspective I think make do um, really is a kind of an undoing of expectations of how we live today and how we consume. That reminds me um, of uh, the uh, very early um, uh, use of um, making do whereby the, uh, the Eureka stockade that the women used bits of their petticoats and other scraps of material to um, create the Eureka flag. And that became a very powerful symbol of protest. It still is, isn't it? Um, uh, those women weren't named the, the, uh, until recently um, in a book and um, uh, I include their names in, in, in my book uh, and the interesting story about it. The um, only other instance, I wondered to myself um, with making do, stimulated by the present situation of, of the pandemic. And it just reminds me, I talk in, in my book about the, um, the Australian uh, AIDS quilt, mm -hmm. the, or the Australian AIDS project is the right way of putting it, but it was ultimately a giant quilt. It was. Uh, that families or uh, uh, partners of loved ones who died uh, had um, memorialized in their own way um, the person who'd passed in uh, some form of textile art. Um, and that was the response back then. And I just wonder what the response will continue to be now if, if um, as as this progresses, what how people will um, use make doing, if you like, and I don't know. It, it it'd be it'll be interesting thing to watch. Yeah, you might the come up with something, Sarah. <laughs> oh yes, there is a COVID quilt that um, a big project um, that Kate Justin Tao Fitzpatrick kind of organised via Instagram. There's been actually a lot of textile make do responses um, to COVID that hopefully end up in, you know, looked after in institutions um, in the end as these kind of uh, domestic expressions as we're all in lockdown, or many of us are in lockdown. Yeah, absolutely. And look, recently we had put on an exhibition, Stitch and Resist, through the Centre of Democracy at the Mill here in Adelaide, which showcased some of this, these types of art and our one of our, our, our curator um, our manager of the Centre of Democracy actually made a, a COVID dress. Uh, it, it's pretty spectacular and it was on display. It, it certainly is something to watch. It's really um, it's a fascinating area and it is evolving. Listen, we're well over time. We've got some other good questions here, but what I'm going to suggest, because one's around, we want to get your favourite piece of folk art, but we don't have time to do it right now. So what we might do is take that offline and get you to, if, if you're willing to put up your favourite piece of folk art, some people aren't, um, it's hard to choose, but we might um, send that out to our readers. And, and also another question about sort of defining folk art a bit more and where, where the distinction between family history and folk history and culture actually lies and, and is there a distinction um, but we might take some of that offline and, and see if we can't get Sarah and Norris to, to answer some of those questions and we'll then distribute that conversation and those answers to our, um, to our listeners when we send out the recordings. So listen, for those of you who are still with us who haven't had to rush off and cook dinner or, or um, 
tend to other things. Thank you very much for tuning in to another edition of Talking History Online. Thank you very much to our speakers, Norris and Sarah. Um, great discussion. These panels are always really, really interesting and it's, it's, it's always a, a, a good conversation to be had. Um, thank you also. We've, I noticed in the chat, some of you are coming to, for, to us from Lockdown Sydney, so we send our thoughts to you. Uh, we know you're doing extremely tough. Melbourne as well. Um, and thank you to those of us further, to those of you further afield in the US, uh, where also things are a bit tough. Um, thank you all. And stay tuned, like I said, if you haven't signed up to our Talking History email list or follow the History Trust social accounts on Facebook and Instagram, please do if you want to stay up to date with Talking History. Next month, we have a really great session on the history of sport. Um, and it's titled, and I'm not very good at titles, but someone else comes up with these, luckily. But let's get physical, preserving South Australia's sporting stories. And we've got a cracker of an event and, and some really great speakers coming up in September. So stay tuned for that. And good night. And thank you again. And all stay safe.